Uh, so Danny thought that it might be helpful to have, um, because some historical context would relevant to the history of Mexico, if we think, you know, you are in Baja, California in 2017, 2018, you know, how do you understand the world that you're experiencing there and, and um, the people who live there and how they ended up there, why they're there. Uh, so he did, this, this is the list of questions Danny asked me to cover, <laughs> which started with, um, who were the original Mexicans? Uh, what happened under Spanish colonization? And then ends with, what are the political and, um, so what are the political challenges that indigenous Mexicans face now? So, <laughs> so I think he wants me to cover 500 years of Mexican history, <laughs> all today. Um, so we'll be here for about eight hours. Um, I tried, we're starting, it's almost 10.30. I tried to get this in, in about an hour. And I'm sorry, I didn't come up with something more interactive, but I hope you guys will stop and ask me questions if you, as we move along. Um, I, I'll introduce something and then I'll ask you guys what you think of it. Um, we'll talk about a couple of key terms. So it's not, I didn't, we're not doing anything super exciting and, and interactive, so I'm sorry. But <laughs> I really want this to be a, a conversation where um, it, I'm eager to hear about your experiences, what you thought and felt and the kinds of relationships that you built when you were in Mexico, what you are looking forward to doing when you go back, and then that also you feel free to ask me questions and as we move along, um, just to feel free that this is a conversation, not just a lecture. That's boring. And you guys are in summer right now, so bless <laughs> you to sit through another lecture. Um, so our topic for today, understanding Mexico and Baja California, but how do we understand the context of our really close neighbor and a nation that we've probably had the closest relationship with over the whole, the whole course of U.S. history. That um, the the fate of Mexico and the United States have always always been really in, intertwined. Um, what comes to mind? Like Mexico and the border between the United States and Mexico has really been in the news lately, right? What's, have you guys been following that? What's happening on the border? You can go. You can go. I don't want to go again. I, I don't follow the Yeah, no, how do you not know? Um, oh, then you can go. <laughs> oh, I don't want to do it. It's sad. <laughs> oh, I kind of know. Is it the immigrant kids? Right. And they're being separated. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, 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 really, the story that everyone's talking about right now is the fact that there are these migrants who are crossing the border into the United States, not, always, not all of them from Mexico, um, many of them from Central America, but they're trying to cross into the United States and claim asylum. And the Trump administration has said, well, that's illegal and against the law, and so we're going to put you into t t detention and we're going to separate families. So the Trump administration has taken very, very young kids and put them in camps over here and then taken their parents and put them in camps over here. which. I think we could probably all agree sounds really horrific, right? That that sounds like a really deep violation of human rights. Um, but actually, some of the things we'll talk about today will help put that migrant contact or that migrant crisis. Why are people coming to the United States? Where, why pick up and leave? Um, and it has to do with the reasons that people end up in Baja California. It's also linked to why people are trying to cross the border into the United States. Um, so, as I was putting this presentation together, I realized that they're kind of two themes, and we are covering, we're going to talk about 500 years of history really quickly, <laughs> but <coughs> there were two themes that kept coming up, and when you think about indigenous communities or native communities in Mexico, there are really two key themes that cover that those 500 years of history, and that's oppression and resistance. So when we talk about native peoples of Mexico and 500 years of history, it's really been a history that's characterized by oppression and resistance. And those are two kind of big terms, but what comes to mind? If you say oppression, what, what comes to mind? Or maybe think of an example. Um, like Russia like, oppressing the media. <laughs> OK, all right. So like <laughs> clamping down on it. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Um, anything else? Slavery. Slavery? Yeah, yeah, definitely, right? So the ownership of one human being by another human being. Um, anything else? Uh, the Native Americans. Native Americans? Okay, yeah, in what sense? Uh, like the whole situation uh, leading to the Trail of Tears. Mm -hmm. Oh, she gave it to me. 
All right, our computer just shut off for some reason, so we'll it back up. Okay, <laughs> so we're talking about um, oppression and some historical examples that came to mind. Um, Trail of Tears, slavery, um, in Russia there's no freedom of speech. Um, any other examples? Or any other ways of, of defining it? Um, if you're a person who's experiencing oppression, what might that look like? Uh-huh. So discrimination. Anything else? Maybe like a loss of rights. Loss of rights? Okay, what kinds of rights? Uh, the right to vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. The right to vote. Um, right to economic equality. Um, sometimes even the right to mobility, right? The right to move around. If you're an enslaved person, it's actually in who can leave the place where you were owned. Um, so really, when we think about the history of Native peoples in Mexico, uh, it's one of oppression. But what do people do? And maybe you can think of historical examples here too. What do people tend to do if they're facing um, an elimination of their rights, or if they don't have any rights, um, or if they have, are facing economic inequality? What do people tend to do? Complain. Complain? <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? <laughs> Revolt. Revolt. <laughs> Can you think of some examples? Uh, the Mexican Revolution. The Mexican Revolution, yes, which we'll talk about today. Certainly. Um, any other historical or contemporary examples? Yeah. French Revolution. Uh, any others? American Revolution. Uh, <laughs> And sometimes, so another term for that is resistance, right? So when people encounter systems of oppression, systems where they are in a position of inequality or are enslaved or are facing um, economic inequality, political inequality, pe so people are facing oppression, most people also tend to resist. And that can come in many forms. So it can come in the form of the Mexican Revolution and an actual war. Um, sometimes it comes in the form of simply running away or trying to leave or organizing together and complaining collectively right, to try to change conditions. Um, so those are, and we'll look at a couple of examples of both of those. So in what ways were Native peoples oppressed in Mexican history and then how have Native peoples organized to resist those conditions? Oops, here's Mexico. And look at this. So prior to uh, the arrival of the Spanish, anybody know, so you guys have taken world history. Anybody just finished world history? All right, so maybe it's pretty good. I hope you on the spot. Um, anyone know when Europeans arrived in what is now Mexico? <laughs> the early 16th century, I think. Yeah, yes, excellent. 1519. So 1519 is when Europeans first arrived in what is now known as Mexico. Uh, prior to the arrival of Europeans, Mexico was actually made up of a variety of indigenous groups, much like North America, right? So we think about oh, well, who, was, who was here in California or across the United States prior to the arrival of Europeans. Well, there were indigenous or native peoples. Um, and here you can see the variety, right? It's a really diverse region um, with a whole number of, of native groups and peoples. Um, in the late 15th century, so about 100 years before the arrival of Europeans, um, many of the regions of what is now Mexico had actually been conquered by an indigenous empire. I don't know who they were. Put up there? Yes. Yeah. Aztecs, yes. Uh, so there was actually already an empire in place in Mexico prior to the arrival of Europeans. So the Aztec people um, centered in what is now Mexico City had actually conquered many of these regions and these peoples across Mexico. Um, and people weren't always happy about it. So there was actually a lot of, and again, this is before the arrival of Europeans, there was a lot of resistance on the part of the Mixtecas, the Zapotecas, who were not entirely happy about being incorporated into the Aztec Empire. Um, I think there were about 78 different indigenous groups in what is now Mexico before Europeans arrived, and actually speaking 78 different languages. So it's a really diverse place. Um, let's see. 
um, they have really complex culture. So what are some stereotypes about Native peoples? And you can think about both Native Americans in the United States or Native peoples in, in Mexico. Are there, what stereotypes commonly circulate about Native peoples? Um, that they're like savages. Right, that they're savages. What else? Uncivilized. What are we going to do? All right, so we're talking about that Mexico is an incredibly diverse place before the Europeans, before the Spanish even arrived. Um, 78 different languages, a whole, a whole mul multitude of, of different indigenous groups. And um, the stereotypes that circulate about native and indigenous peoples, both in the United States and in Mexico, is that they're, uh, you guys mentioned, uncivilized, savage, hunters and gatherers were not urban, didn't live in urban areas, were very local and regional, didn't have contact with people who may have lived hundreds of thousands of miles away. And what archaeologists and historians have discovered recently in the past um, 25 to 30 years is that actually um, native peoples and their societies were incredibly complex before Europeans arrived. Uh, this is Monte Alban, which was um, well, it's still there, um, but it was a major urban area that I believe was part of the Mixteca peoples. Um, so this was a large city and existed before the Europeans arrived. So, and I point this out just so that we don't fall into that trap right then. Is she close to you at the... the Do you, is it hard to see? Yeah. Better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. okay. Uh, just that we don't want to fall into that stereotype that Native peoples were simple, simple, they were just hunters and gatherers, lived in small tribes, when in fact what uh, Cortez, who's the Spanish conquistador who arrives in Mexico in 1519, what he encounters is actually an incredibly dynamic um, and complex urban society. So the Aztecs had an empire, they incorporated peoples around them into that empire, and there were major urban areas across what is now Mexico. In fact, cities that were far larger in Mexico than cities in, in Europe. Um, so you'll get the, the size of cities in the Americas, actually larger than big imperial capitals like London, Rome, even Madrid. Uh, so actually really large urban areas and extensive networks of trade and commerce. So really advanced societies existed before the Europeans arrived. Um, okay, I know this might seem really far removed from going to Baja in 2018, <laughs> but I promise you there'll be connections and you'll, you'll start to pull it all together. And if I'm repeating something that you guys already know, please stop me. You're like, yeah, we know that. Uh -huh. Move on. All right. Um, but then the Spanish arrive. So uh, it's Cortez who arrives first in what is now Mexico in 1519. You guys taking AP history? No. Nobody likes history that much. <laughs> All right, so it's Cortez who arrives in what is now Mexico in 1519. Um, why did they come? Why were the Spanish expanding across the world? What were they interested in? Yeah. They're trying to find a trade room. Okay, so trade route to Asia. Yep, that's definitely true. What else? Are they looking for other stuff? <laughs> well, why look for a trade route to Asia? Just for fun. It gets stronger and bigger. Okay, stronger and bigger. Uh, so they wanted to see their sort of their nation, the power of their nation grow, power of their empire grow. Uh, why else? Why do you want to trade? Why do you go looking for natural resources? To get richer, yes. And in fact, it's the Spanish conquistadors, right? So all of these Spaniards who leave Spain at the very end of the 15th and into the early 16th century, when they leave Spain, they're very explicit about it. So this is a guy called Bernal Diaz del Castillo. He arrives in Mexico with um, Cortez, who's known as the conqueror of Mexico. And he actually writes, what does he say about why the Spanish are building an empire? I'll read it first. You guys are so shy. We came to serve God and to get rich as all men wish yes. to do. Yes. So we came to serve God and to get rich as all men wish to do. Um, and I actually heard the argument recently that you can think of um, these conquistadors as like early venture capitalists. That they were actually, like, oh, many of them were in debt. So they actually leave Spain because they need to make money and they're desperate to make money quickly. So it's not just about like bringing glory to Spain or, or Italy, um, 
or to find a trade route, it was very explicitly they came to get rich. They wanted to make money. And many of them were so in debt in their native countries, uh, most of them from Spain, that they, they were like, well, I have nothing to lose. I might as well get on the ship, which was incredibly risky, uh, very well knowing that they might never return. Uh, but because they said, well, hopefully we'll get rich, and we'll get rich fast. Uh, so that is why Spain built an empire. And uh, the parts marked in red uh, constitute the Spanish empire by the 17th century. So pretty expansive and global. Um, so it's uh, Fernando Cortez, who's known as the conqueror of Mexico, and he arrives in 1519. And by 19, uh, 1519, and by 1521, um, he and his Spanish forces have subjugated the Aztec Empire. So they, they take Montezuma, who's the, the Aztec emperor, into custody. And there's a number of battles, like two years of fighting. Uh, they take him into custody. And they say that Montezuma was killed accidentally, but probably not. It's likely he was killed deliberately by the Spanish. Uh, and it's really interesting, because Cortez arrives on the shores of Mexico. And he's asked by an indigenous person, why are you here? And his response is really interesting. It's much like um, Bernal Diaz's response. He says, that's a quote, it's really good. Um, I have a disease of the heart that can only be cured by gold. <laughs> and so again, really explicit that we're here to, be, we're here to make money, and we want to make money fast. Um, it's interesting, though, and uh, maybe you guys, maybe you'll remember, because you've just taken world history. Um, how do a few thousand Spaniards conquer an entire empire? Because you think about it, right? The numbers are not really on the side of the Spanish. They don't know the terrain. There are only a few thousand of them. Uh, how are they able to conquer a fairly significant empire? Um, I'm pretty sure the people thought that they were gods. That's actually a myth that's been debunked by historians recently. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Not your fault, though, because I think it's still taught in history yeah, classes that way. Um, they thought they were unusual. They definitely, like, right, the Aztecs see the arrival of the Spanish and they're like, huh, this is something new. You don't see this every day. Um, yeah. Okay, so part, um, in part, <coughs> superior firepower. Yeah. So that's in part disease. That is really the key. That's the key. Uh, because, again, you only have, you have Cortez conquers the Aztec Empire in two years, um, in part because of technology and guns, but mostly because of disease. It's only a few thousand Spanish who arrive here. There were 25 million, I forgot to mention this earlier, there are 25 million indigenous peoples living in what is now Mexico. So you can think about, right, a few thousand Spaniards, 25 million indigenous people in Mexico. The, the odds were really against the Spanish. But what they had that they didn't realize was going to work so much in their favor was a whole list of terrible diseases that native Mexicans had never been exposed to. Um, my students, when I do this lecture in my class, students always laugh because some of the, I mean, the diseases were awful, but um, how I didn't include the whole list. Um, but the most significant is smallpox. Um, but there are also a lot of sexually transmitted diseases that also killed off Native peoples, and because they'd been isolated, right? They did not, they had no exposure to diseases that were brought from Europe, and smallpox ends up being the largest killer, uh, and it kills hundreds of thousands of people, um, millions, actually. So by, I have a statistic for you, where? Um, by about 100 years after the arrival of the Spanish, the indigenous population of, of Mexico had gone from 25 million to about a million people. So that's, I, I can't, what percentage is that? 25 million down to one. 96%. 96 96%. Uh, the indigenous population recovers, so eventually it does, like, it, it starts to increase, going from 25 million down to a million. But, it's a, a die-off rate of 96%. That's how you guys are really good at math. <laughs> uh, really, really devastating. Uh, all right. So what kind of, so another question Danny asked, what kind of society develops? So once the Spanish have conquered Mexico, what kind of society emerges? And because they're there, right, conquistadors are there looking for money, they want to get rich, and get rich quickly. 
uh, they start a system called encomienda. Have you guys, you guys encountered that word before? Don't remember? Yes, in world history I heard that word. Uh, you can think of it as tax. Think of it as a tax system. Essentially what, well, you guys want to analyze that image? <laughs> what do you think is going on in that image? Okay, so it looks like a priest is trying to stop. And what what race or ethnicity would you say he is? Uh, Spanish and yeah, indigenous, right? So it looks like the priest is trying to intervene and stop a Spanish overseer from physically beating and mistreating an indigenous person. So the system, and so the image is actually linked to this idea of the system called encomienda. And what it was is that the Spanish crown said, well, we rule this empire, there it is. but to reward the people who've conquered this empire, so to reward the Spaniards who have gone, risked their lives to conquer this empire, we will give them grants of land and of people. So it wasn't just that the Spanish who settled in the New World were getting grants of land, they also got control over the people who lived there. And what they could do is they could force that workforce to work for them for free, whether it was in agriculture um, or mining. Those were the two largest industries. And so this is, they were called encomendero, labor, mostly in agriculture and in mining. Um, there was one other goal of the Spanish Empire, and that was to also convert Native peoples to Catholicism. So we go back to that quote, right? We came here to get rich and serve God. Um, the other goal of the Spanish Empire was to convert native peoples and peoples around the world to Catholicism. So kind of hand in hand, you have conquistadors as well as the Spanish church. And the church would sometimes intervene on behalf of native peoples. So that's what we see happening in this image right here. The church would say, well, this is actually, this person is a child of God. Um, they may serve you, but you shouldn't abuse or exploit them. And this system is put in place in the 16th century, but it really lasts through Mexican independence, which happens, the war for Mexican independence starts in 1810. And you can still see ramifications of the system in Mexico today. It may seem, this again, this may seem really far removed, but the, I guess the heritage or the, the legacy of this the system of labor still, you can still see it in Mexico. Uh, so along with this kind of economic system that develops where a handful of Spaniards have been granted these really large tracts of land, not only do they get the land, but they also get the free labor of the native peoples who live there. Um, a very, a pretty complex racial system also develops in New Spain. Um, what is now Mexico, when it was part of the Spanish colony was called New Spain. Uh, so, and it's called the casta system, the casta system. And you don't have to remember it, like, you don't have to remember all of those terms, but essentially the important thing to remember is that the Spanish were at the very top, and of course, who's at the bottom? Right, Native peoples and African slaves. So much like the United States, Africans were imported out of Africa into New Spain as slaves, and if you think about the racial hierarchy that develops in New Spain, Spaniards are at the top, and at the bottom, native peoples and enslaved Africans. And then there's a lot of um, intermixing, because people are having sex, getting married, making children, and so there's a lot of racial mixing in between, which is why the, the, the racial system in Mexico looks really different than what happens in the United States because in the English colonies there's not as much racial intermixing between enslaved peoples and native peoples and European colonizers. But if you look at Mexico, there's actually a lot, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of racial intermixing. Um, 
and I'm sorry, this is a little bit hard to see, but uh, the, the Spanish crown was like, what is happening in the colonies? Who are all these, what, like, all of these racial groups are meeting and, and having sex and creating families and making babies. And so what does that racial system look like? And so they actually would, in the colonies, because there's no Snapchat, <laughs> there's no Facebook, um, there are no cameras. So in the colonies, they'd actually paint these paintings, and there are thousands of them painted, and they would send them back to Spain. And it was just, these are essentially paintings of the races and racial mixings that are occurring in New Spain during the colonial period. Um, so they would have um, Spanish plus indigenous equals mestizo, um, Spanish plus African equals mulatto, and so they paint these paintings there we go. and send them back to the Spanish government. So the Spanish government could get a sense of this really multiracial and multi uh, racially mixed society that's emerging in New Spain. Uh, if you are, there are several of these at LACPA, they're called Costa paintings. If you ever want to take a look, you could go to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. They're really interesting because you can see. This is a boring way to think about the racial structure and hierarchy uh, that emerges in New Spain, but if you want to see the paintings in person, they're really interesting, and that LACMA has a few. So it's called the Casa System. Um, it was an attempt to organize people racially in a hierarchy in New Spain, with Spanish at the top, and then of course native peoples and enslaved peoples at the bottom. Um, there's also, I didn't put this term up there, but um, the Spanish considered, they called, they had a term for native peoples, they called them neophytes, meaning new person. And essentially what the Spanish thought about native peoples was that they were, um, they were like children. So while the Spanish were civilized, they knew God, uh, and were more evolved and were Christian, that native peoples were like children. They were less evolved, less civilized, and that it was the job of the Spanish to help native peoples become more civilized, to introduce them to Christianity, and to hopefully one day like, sort of guide their growth um, into being people of reason or racially equivalent to the Spanish. Um, all right. So we talked about racial hierarchy that develops, lots of racial intermingling. Uh, so historians have also asked the question, why did Native peoples participate in this system? So you see two, two things emerging. Um, one, the system of encomienda, where essentially Native peoples were bound laborers. Um, it would, there are similarities between this economic system that develops in New Spain and the system of slavery that it develops in what would become the United States. So historians ask the question, well, why would people participate? Well, how would they allow themselves to end up in this situation? Uh, given what we've talked about, why do you suppose they would? I suppose the native peoples end up in this, in this kind of system. Okay, all right, so maybe like strong political systems have been toppled, right? The native political system has been toppled. Yeah, that's definitely true. Anything else? Uh, historians argue that it is in large part due to disease. So if you look at mortality rates of over 90% across the region, you think about it, right? You could even put yourselves in that position. If 90% of the, your family and friends and community died within a very short period of time, essentially two generations, would you feel really displaced and vulnerable? Probably, right? Uh, so, so historians argue that it was really, it was disease and the unsettling um, impact of such high mortality rates that land native peoples in this position. That it was just, it was incredibly difficult to resist when 90% of your community has been decimated. Um, I finally found my list of, these are the diseases that the Spanish brought to the New World. So smallpox, typhus, measles, 
influenza, syphilis, bubonic plague, malaria, tuberculosis, mumps, and yellow fever. And it's a very depressing list of diseases brought by the Spanish to the New World. Smallpox, typhus, measles, influenza, syphilis, bubonic plague, malaria, tuberculosis. Um, there were 25 million indigenous peoples when Cortez arrived. About 100 years later, it gets down to a million. Uh, despite this, there is continued resistance. So even though this system emerges hand in hand with this racial system or racial hierarchy, there are, of course, continued moments of resistance. There's never, um, until the Mexican Revolution in 1910, there's no nationwide uprising or revolt, but there were local revolts um, uh, regional revolts across Mexico from the moment the Spanish conquered the Aztec Empire right up through the Mexican Revolution 400 years later. Uh, so it wasn't that people were uh, entirely subjugated, there just was no national or, or a widespread revolt. Revolt was very localized. Um, yeah. Why didn't the Native American diseases affect the Spanish as much? Ah, uh, um, that is a really good question. Um, I'd have to look that up. And there's actually a book, it's called Guns, Germs, and Steel. And it's like that thing, so if you want to read it. <laughs> Where the author, this guy, a really famous historian named Jared Diamond goes through that. Um, there were, there were, it wasn't that Native peoples lived in like a pristine society that was free from illness, but there were fewer infectious diseases in the Americas, so that's part of it. Um, and there was, there was some degree of things going the other direction as well, right? Spanish picking up diseases in the Americas and taking them back to Europe. Uh, but they just didn't spread as quickly. So we wouldn't see widespread epidemics the way you did in the Americas. That's a really good question. Uh, any other questions? Moving really quickly here to the Mexican history. <laughs> um, and other forms of resistance included running away, um, breaking tools, refusing to work. Um, so even though, again, even though we don't see widespread revolt against the Spanish colonial system until 1910, um, or, or against the system of labor until 1910, there were always localized, right? people were always resisting. And, and then sometimes, too, we don't think about maintaining culture or language or religion as a way of resisting. Uh, but that's what Native peoples did as well. So the Spanish really wanted to, right, they wanted to convert Native people to Catholicism. They wanted Native peoples to only speak Spanish. And indigenous groups often refused to do that. So they would refuse to convert to Catholicism or refuse to give up culture and traditions and language, even though they were trying to be forced to by the Spanish. Um, this was painted much later. It's painted in 1951 by the famous muralist Diego Rivera. But uh, you can see cultural resistance, I think, in this image. Uh, this is supposed to be Cortez. And what do you suppose Diego Rivera's perspective was on Cortez? Goblin. Goblin. <laughs> Anything else? What's the, what's what kind of commentary is Diego Rivera making on Cortez? They're not even human. Uh huh. And these are the Spaniards, right? So it's kind of a reversal. Uh, anything else? He does look really clownish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely poking fun at him. Uh, what is he interested in? According to this image? Money. Cool. Yeah. Right, so you can see, right, using culture to resist Spanish empire. Uh, all right, so um, people in New Spain revolt against the Spanish Empire in 1810. And actually, the, the War of Independence, and it lasts for 11 years, so it goes from 1810 to 1821, and it was really led by indigenous people. They, they composed half of the forces that fought against Spain, and they see it as a moment of opportunity to try to get rid of this type of labor system, which had been in place for 300 years. Uh, so when New Spain revolts against Spain and 
is struggling for independence, and there are a lot of parallels with the American, uh, the American Revolution and American independence from England. So when the people of New Spain revolt, revolt against Spain, um, that effort is really spearheaded by native peoples. They see this as a moment to throw off particularly colonial systems of labor. Um, it's a long, long war, but finally by 1821, Mexico has won independence from Spain, so they're no longer part of the Spanish Empire. Unfortunately, what indigenous and native peoples had hoped for, which was a change in the economic system, doesn't occur. So there's a lot of hope and enthusiasm that uh, native peoples will be able to claim land that had been taken from them 300 years before, and that they could take apart this economic system where they were really at the bottom, where they're working as very exploited laborers. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. So although the country gains independence, and Mexico is now an independent nation by 1821, the labor and economic system really doesn't shift that much. So by the mid 19th century, um, following the, the Mexican War for Independence, most indigenous people are still engaged in the same type of labor that they've been involved with under Spanish rule. And that's predominantly agricultural and mining. And it was um, millions of people working for a small handful of landowners. So land was concentrated in the hands of a few. <clears throat> and then there was a very poorly paid, mostly indigenous labor force. Uh, it's kind of interesting too because it was actually in the 19th century that indigenous people in Mexico received citizenship. So as the country emerges out of the wars for independence and they're doing much like in the United States, right, writing a constitution, working on building a new nation, indigenous people are actually granted citizenship. So they're supposed to have the full rights of anyone else in Mexico. Um, so despite this racial hierarchy that had developed after independence, native peoples are included in the new nation as citizens. Uh, but does winning citizenship automatically mean something like economic equality? Can you think of an example from the United States? You should be. I don't know, it's like, I don't know, it's like, but yeah, I don't always get equality even though you're a citizen. Yeah, okay. that's definitely true. Anybody think of an example from the United States? Yeah. Uh, during the Reconstruction, uh, slaves were technically, slaves and women were technically granted equal. Oh, yeah, but slaves, yeah. Uh -huh. slaves, and then, but they're still, uh, like the, um, um, I forget what it was, but it was like basically like slavery all over again. It's a black codes and yeah. the right of Jim Crow, yeah. Uh, so there's a great historical parallel. If you think about the American Civil War, it was over slavery. And at the conclusion of the war, slavery is abolished, uh, slavery is declared illegal in the United States, and African Americans are granted the right of citizenship. But does, that does not mean that African Americans enjoy full political equality, right? So although they gained citizenship, they didn't have really any access to um, economic resources or the ability to create full economic equality. So although they could vote, technically, right, that didn't doesn't immediately transfer into full equality. And so there's a parallel in Mexico, where in the 19th century, indigenous people are granted citizenship, right? So you think, oh, they have the full rights of anybody else in Mexico, but they don't have access to land. They've gone centuries without access, really, to any economic resources. Um, they don't have very good access to education. So again, right, citizenship is one for all people in Mexico, but it doesn't automatically translate into full economic equality or access to resources. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so between um, Mexican independence from Spain and the early 1900s, the lives and experiences of most indigenous people in Mexico remains relatively the same. Although they have access to citizenship, they do not have access to a lot of economic resources. And most are still trapped in very poorly paid agricultural jobs. Uh, a moment of resistance, go back to our terms, right? thinking about these two terms over the course of 500 years of Mexican history, here we go, oppression and resistance. Uh, 
massive widespread resistance occurs again in Mexico in the form of the Mexican Revolution, which begins in 1910. And like Mexican independence, led by native peoples. So it was really indigenous and mestizo, mestizo meaning um, a mixture of Spanish and indigenous people. So it's indigenous people and mestizos who really lead the Mexican Revolution. Famous, anybody know who this is? Famous, famous Mexican revolutionary. Pancho Villa. <laughs> uh, so it's mostly agricultural workers in Mexico in 1910 who revolt against an economic system that still has not changed, right? That employs millions of poor indigenous Mexicans as agricultural laborers, but they do not have access to land, they're very poorly paid. And in 1910, they revolt and they are led by um, well-known figureheads like Pancho Villa in the north and Emiliano Zapata in the south. It's the revolt happens in Mexico. Um, anybody know what the rallying cry was from the Mexican Revolution? Oh, I love this image. It wasn't just men who were revolutionaries, women too. Uh, it's the women Mexican revolutionaries. Land and liberty. The slogan, one of the slogans of the Mexican Revolution when it breaks out in 1910 is land and liberty. So what do people want? They revolt in 1910 and their slogan is land and liberty. What do they want? <laughs> land. <laughs> and liberty, right, so an ability to practice their full rights as citizens. Um, so Mexican Revolution, and it lasts about 10 years, so 1910. Uh, Mexican, Revo uh, Mexican Constitution is rewritten again as a result of the revolution. And if you read the Mexican Constitution that's rewritten, I think it's in 1917, it's actually, it's really radical. So it reiterates full citizenship rights and equality for all Mexicans, regardless of their ethnic background. So if you look at the Constitution that's written in 1917, it's really trying to topple this racial system. Um, and Americans were appalled. Americans were so upset about the Mexican Revolution, in part because it said we can take private property held by just a handful of people in Mexico and redistribute it to the poor and indigenous communities of Mexico. So we can take these big land owning, these big land holdings that had come from this system, right? some of those grants had gone all the way back to the Mexican, uh, excuse me, to the Spanish crown. So we're talking about land grants that were 400 years old, thousands of acres. And the Mexican constitution that's rewritten in 1917 as a result of the revolution said, the government can take those large pieces of land, break them up, right? take private property, break them up, and give them back to native peoples. Um, so take these big land holdings, give them to small, individual farmers or to the communities, farming communities. Sometimes, uh, particularly in the south of Mexico, they said, well, we, hold, we historically held land collectively before the arrival of the Spanish, so we want communal land grants given back to our communities. Um, so the Mexican Revolution and the Constitution that comes out of it is really It really takes private property and tries to pull it apart. So we're gonna give it back to the collective good. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't really happen. So again, if you read the Mexican Constitution in 1917, it sounds really radical, right? The idea that you could take a large piece of private property and redistribute it to the people, that sounds pretty radical. Would that ever happen in the United States? No, right? I think private property rights are probably more important than citizenship rights in the United States. Uh, described in our Constitution. So the Mexican Constitution seems really radical. We're going to take private property and give it back to the people. Uh, unfortunately, it does not unfold very well. The government tries to do it. Um, they take a lot of land from wealthy landowners and they try to redistribute it to indigenous and poor communities. 
but the process is really, really messy. Uh, there are still applications pending now from indigenous groups that they filed in the 1920s and 1930s. So they went to the government, they said, we would like to claim land, uh, farmland that should come back to us as a community. And it's like 80 years later, and those claims have still not been processed. So, well, in theory, right, the revolution changed a lot, and the new constitution said, we're going to try to provide economic resources in the form of land to native peoples. That process became very messy, and for most indigenous communities, they are not able to access land that they thought they would get. All right, so that leads us to indigenous Mexicans now. So although the Mexican Constitution of 1917 was really written to try to create much more social equality in Mexico, over the 20th century, it does, really doesn't emerge. Uh, so Danny wanted to talk about, well, where are, are there still indigenous people in Mexico and where are they concentrated? Uh, so the indigenous population of Mexico is about 20%, which is big, it's really high. Um, people who can trace their ancestry predominantly to indigenous roots, about 20% of the Mexican population. Um, if you look at this map, where are they concentrated? Where are most indigenous Mexican communities concentrated? In the south, particularly in Oaxaca. So Oaxaca actually has the highest concentration of native peoples. I think it's about 30%. And indigenous peoples from Oaxaca, uh, m many of them still speak their native language. So some will be bilingual, they'll speak their native language as well as speaking Spanish. Um, some communities speak only their indigenous or native language, they actually don't speak Spanish. Um, and 20% of Mexico's population equals 17 million people. So it's a really large and substantial population. 17 million people um, identify as an indigenous in Mexico. Uh, they live throughout Mexico, but as we can see from the map, they're really concentrated in southern states, including Oaxaca, Chiapas, and the Yucatan. And sadly, despite the hopes that the Mexican Revolution and the new constitution that was written in 1917 would really create more social equality, Sadly, it did not. So if you look at, um, I'm sorry, this chart is cut off, but this is, these are national statistics and then for indigenous peoples in Mexico. So the number of indigenous peoples in Mexico living in poverty is really, really high. Um, extreme poverty, 40%. Income poverty, about 40% as well. So if you put that together, it means about 80% of indigenous peoples in Mexico are living in very dire economic circumstances. And because Mexico is a poor nation, uh, there's not also not a lot of access to free education. So Mexican law says every Mexican citizen should have access to, at least through a high school education, and it should be free. Um, but because Mexico is a poor place, there's not a lot of funding for education, particularly in poor and indigenous communities. So only about 40% of indigenous peoples in Mexico finish sixth grade. So it means 60% of indigenous peoples in Mexico don't finish elementary school. Going back, so looking at right, some very oppressive economic circumstances that Native people still face, but as always, there's continued resistance. Um, we saw it, we saw big movements for Native rights in Mexico beginning in the 1970s and continuing through today. Um, anybody know who the, what the EZLN is? It's this, the Zapatista uprising that happened in Chiapas beginning in 1992. So it's native peoples in the state of Chiapas who rose up against the government of Mexico. Um, and this is just one example. There have actually been dozens and dozens of organizations and movements led by indigenous peoples for indigenous rights in Mexico since the 1970s. Um, but the Zapatistas are probably the most famous, in part, I think, because of the masks. So the images coming out of Chiapas around the Zapatista uprising became really famous across the world. Uh, here's another image. 
And what were Native peoples looking for? So when these uprisings started happening in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, what were Native peoples demanding? There were a couple of things. One, they wanted the Mexican government to recognize their native languages and to not force them to learn Spanish. And in particular, they wanted native and indigenous languages taught in schools. So they said, we should have the right to send our children to school in our historic language. Don't force us to learn Spanish. Uh, they also demanded access, more <coughs> access to education. So they said we want increased schools in rural areas and in, in indigenous communities. Uh, they also demanded political autonomy. So they said we want our communities to be self-governing rather than the Mexican state and laws coming out of Mexico City telling us what to do, we want some autonomy. And they have won that. So particularly if you look at Oaxaca, uh, there are about 500 cities in Oaxaca, and 400 of those are actually governed by native peoples. Um, so they have to have a relationship with the official Mexican government, but at the community level, they run their own <laughs> political systems and elections and make decisions locally and within their indigenous community. Does that make sense? Um, you can cut a parallel in the US would, if you think about Indian reservations um, and Indian uh, tribal lands, where they have to have a relationship with the United States government, but they're also at the local level autonomous and able to make some decisions independently. Uh, questions? One last section. We're going to get to Baja now. <laughs> so there's this question of, and I think most of the people and the communities you're working with in Baja were from Oaxaca. Yes? Mistec? Is that okay? So how do people from, how do communities from Oaxaca, way down here, end up way up here in Baja, California? Um, did you guys talk about that with them? And I know communication might be hard. How many of you speak Spanish? A lot of uh, workers, migrant workers that we work with, they don't speak Spanish. Don't speak Spanish. Yeah. Oh, so speak only indigenous yeah. languages. Yeah. Um, so how do you guys communicate? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> you try. Okay. Um, so we're talking about workers who really are part of this very rich indigenous history. Very. Okay. Uh, so do you guys know anything about how people from Oaxaca end up in Baja? Uh, guesses. Why do you suppose people would pick up, right, if they, their roots in Oaxaca go back more than 500 years, why do you suppose they might pick up and move thousands of miles to the north? Yeah. Uh, show in the dark, just like find work. Yes, exactly. <laughs> precisely. Uh, so the economies of southern Mexico have struggled um, in part because of NAFTA, I won't go into that, um, but in part because of international trade agreements that have undermined um, the agricultural economies of southern Mexican states. Um, so we're talking like big trade deals brokered between the president of the United States and the president of Mexico have made farming and the economies of southern Mexican states really unstable. So there's not a lot of work. And as we saw, poverty rates are really high. And as in the case of most people, um, so my dad's from Korea. My grandmother came from Korea to the US because she was looking for work, right? That's, it, lots of times that's why people move, looking for work and economic opportunities. So we've seen a migration, um, a fairly significant migration out of Oaxaca into Baja, California, and then also into where we live. There are a lot of Oaxacans in the state of California. Uh, most come looking for work. And their trade, their skills are in agricultural labor, so they've been looking for agricultural jobs in Baja, California, as well as in our California. Our California. Uh, most are employed, so if you're in Baja, most are employed for large, large agricultural companies. 
many of them American agricultural companies. Anybody eaten Driscoll berries? American company that grows berries in Baja, California. Uh, also tomatoes. So you guys, have you ever looked at the, a carton of tomatoes and looked at where they come from? I would say 90% of the time it'll say product of Mexico and probably coming out of Baja. A ton of our food, especially fresh produce that we eat in California, is actually imported from Mexico, a lot of it from Baja. And these are transnational corporations, so they're American companies, but they're operating in Mexico. And they employ migrant workers that are coming out of Oaxaca looking for economic opportunities. Uh, why do you suppose American companies would be operating in Mexico? Yeah. Uh, cheaper. It's cheaper. What's cheaper? Workforce. Labor is cheaper. Um, and this is not just true of agriculture, it's also true of electronics, of clothing, of shoes, um, all kinds of things, cars, all kinds of things are produced in Mexico because the labor is much cheaper. And American corporations want to make the highest profit margins possible, right? So you make more money by depressing your costs. Uh, so you go looking for lower labor costs. Uh, so you guys know how much money an agricultural worker in Baja, California makes? Not quite that bad. Um, <laughs> is it around like ten dollars a day? It is. Mm -hmm. uh, or by like weight, right? So how much do you pick? So it's called piecework. But if you look on average, agricultural workers in Baja California make about on the low end eight dollars a day, on the higher end twelve dollars a day. It's just it, and if you bring it down to the number of hours, they're working less than a dollar an hour. Um, so that sounds pretty oppressive, right? We've talked about things of oppression and resistance. Probably having to work for such a small amount of money sounds like an exploitative labor situation. Um, as always, though, there is also resistance. And so indigenous communities who've migrated from Oaxaca are now living and working in Baja, California, have also organized. Uh, and they come together in cultural as well as labor organizations. One, to try to preserve and continue to preserve indigenous customs, culture, and language, even though they're no longer living in Oaxaca, to try to preserve those practices, language, in Baja, California, and then also in California. And then people have also come together to organize in labor organizations and to try to increase wages or improve wages and working conditions. <coughs> So it's actually a really big historic strike. Uh, do you guys, are you near San Quentin? Where you go? Two hours south of us is San Quentin. San Quentin, okay. Um, so there's a really, there's a huge historic strike in San Quentin between 19, or, excuse me, 2015 and 2016, where, oh, I forgot the numbers, thousands of workers went on strike for 12 weeks. Uh, it actually impacted food supplies to Southern California because crops were not being picked, which meant they weren't being shipped up here for us to eat and enjoy. Uh, workers went on strike demanding $12 a day of an into sexual harassment, because there's rampant sexual harassment of women working in agriculture in Baja, California. And also improved working conditions. They also wanted, many of them are paid cash, and they want their employers to pay into the national social security system, which means that someday they could retire. Their, their um, wages are uh, recorded officially, and their companies are paying into a retirement system that uh, at some point they'll be able to retire. So those were their demands when they went on strike. Uh, they won some of them. Most of the big employers in Baja, California now pay around $12 a day. But that's still not very much. And really what the result is that we get to enjoy cheap produce in Southern California, right? It's, we can get berries for very inexpensive prices. Uh, but agricultural workers in Baja are continuing to suffer. Work, living or trying to survive on $12 a day, support family on $12 a day, it's really... Uh, 
there are a couple, if you guys want to read a little bit more before you go, I included um, some additional resources, and I'm going to give Danny this presentation, so if you'd like to do a little more reading. Um, Oaxaca, California is a website and an organization developed to chronicling uh, how Oaxacans who are moving across Mexico and into the United States are trying to maintain indigenous languages, indigenous culture. Um, and then there's also, this is a Los Angeles Times article on the strike. So this historic labor strike that happened in Baja, California, and a year later the LA Times went to look and see well, what did farm workers gain and what are they still struggling with. So you could read that, that's pretty short. Um, and this is another, this is an article about indigenous rights and how indigenous communities are trying to um, maintain self-determination, which really means local control over their communities. All right, I'll stop there. Danny, did I cover all the things you wanted yeah, to yeah, cover? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> are there, yeah questions? Um, why haven't there been any like, significant political movements of like politicians advocating for the like, uh, that's a really good question. So why have there been any significant political movements, politicians advocating for indigenous peoples? Um, it's a complicated answer. One, there have been, and I couldn't cover everything. Right? In the hour we had together, I couldn't cover everything. Um, for example, I think right now there's an indigenous woman actually running for the president to be president of Mexico. It's unlikely that she'll win. But um, she said the whole point of me running is, I know I'm not going to win. I will probably not end up being the president of Mexico. But by me running, it draws attention to issues that indigenous communities face in Mexico. So there have been, there are political movements. Um, that's just one example. Um, the Zapatista uprising is another example. Um, the, the other part of that is, the other answer to that is that even though the Mexican Revolution sought to topple this really unequal economic system, as well as that really unequal racial system, it wasn't fully successful. So there's still a mostly white, mostly very wealthy, small political elite that runs the nation of Mexico. And so politicians at the kind of highest levels of power in Mexico are not all that interested in indigenous rights, which is depressing but true. And not all that different from the United States, right? I would say that indigenous rights is not at the top of Donald Trump's agenda. <laughs> so it's kind of sometimes it's easy to point fingers and be like, man, what's wrong with Mexico? Why is there so much political corruption? Why is there not more social equality? Well, we have very similar problems here too. Um, yeah. Uh, so like you uh, mentioned, like for the workers going on the strike, and like because her sexual harassment was an issue, who would sexually harass them? Overseer or. Um, the foreman. So most of the uh, the foreman who oversee the crews picking are men, and so women would be harassed by their coworkers or actually by the foreman that they were working for. And because it was so, the the um, the workplaces were really dominated by men. People would just turn a blind eye to things as violent as rape. And were these American people that were uh, overseas? Um, no, most of them were Mexican as well. So although it's American companies, most of the overseas and foreign are, are Mexican. Um, other questions? Other thing to keep in mind is that uh, a lot of the workforce that picks, there's a lot of people also facing issues of sexual harassment. <coughs> Uh, oh, Danny, I think you also asked the question, why can't they vote? So what, and why can't their children go to school? And I did a ton of research on that. And legally, they have the right to vote. But in practice, I think it varies a lot by location. I think indigenous peoples are discouraged from voting. Um, I mean, much like African Americans are in the United States, there are efforts to disenfranchise them. Um, Political participation in national elections for indigenous peoples is very low in Mexico. And I don't think it's because people don't want to practice their citizenship rights. I think it's because they're discouraged. Any other questions? I'm sorry, I did a lot of talking. I was hoping we'd be a little bit more of a conversation, but I really <laughs> threw a lot of information at you. Oh, does it help contextualize things that you saw and experienced in Mexico? Can you make connections between 
your experiences in traveling there and what we talked about today? What, any examples? in Spanish, but most of it was like a native language. So, so probably, yeah. And I was, because Danny was also talking, he asked me a question about how come their children can't go to school. Like, probably because Baja California does not offer education in native languages. Um, and then going back to the point too, although universal education is supposed to be guaranteed in Mexico, there are just not enough schools for all the students. Like, there are whole regions and communities that just don't have a publicly funded school. Um, and then the other sad reality is that children are often working with their parents. So parents can actually not afford to send them to school because they're not the types of child labor protection laws in Mexico that they are here, or if they're, they are on the books, right? Laws against child labor are on the books in Mexico. They're not enforced meaning that children as young as six and seven can be working in agricultural jobs with their, sometimes with their parents, sometimes not. I've watched a really heart-wrenching documentary about tomato farms in Mexico where children actually leave their families as young as six and seven and are living in dormitories and picking tomatoes for part of the year. So some of the reality is that children in Mexico don't go to school because their parents can't afford it. Yeah. Uh, this might seem kind of like a dumb question, yeah, but like, why, because you said like, um, like the people like come to California and work as agricultural workers and like they don't get paid minimum wage because mm -hmm. they're undocumented. Mm -hmm. Why do they come un like, ah, undocumented? Oh, okay, great question, undocumented. And which leads us full circle back to the, the crisis at the border, right, that we started with. So this is, that's a really interesting question. Um, <coughs> the whole concept of who is legal and illegal in the United States is completely artificial, right? It's made up. And people like to argue, oh, if you cross the border, you're breaking the law, um, you're a criminal. Well, the law that was put into place that said you cannot migrate across the southern border of the United States was really not put into place and enforced until the 1960s. So prior to 1960, if you were from Mexico or Central America, you could cross almost freely into the United States. And it was in part because agricultural um, corporations and big landowners in places like California wanted and needed a workforce. They needed farm workers, and they could not convince people in the United States to do those jobs. They'd actually send recruiters into Mexico and say, uh, we'll pay you an extra X number of dollars if you come and work on our farm in California. We guarantee you this wage. We will provide you with housing. The conditions were still not great, but there were actively, right, growers and landowners were actively trying to recruit Mexican workers to come into the United States. Then some people who sounded an awful like, lot like Donald Trump in the 1950s and 1960s started to say, there are too many Mexicans coming to the United States. We don't want that to happen anymore. So they passed a law that said now we're going to enforce, really strictly enforce immigration from Mexico into the United States. So we created a law, right? We created a law that said we don't want any more immigration from Mexico. Do we still need Mexican workers? Yeah, I guarantee, like, the economy of the United States would shut down if Mexican workers stopped working. Um, California especially. So even though we passed a law that said we don't want any more migrants from Mexico coming into the United States, passed in 1965. Our economy still needs Mexican workers, workers from Latin America. And workers in Latin America still want to work in the United States. So they keep crossing the border. And we've deemed them illegal or criminal or undocumented. But we could change that law easily. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah there was a second part, though, right? Um, like, how do they gain like citizenship? Mm. Um, and why do most of them not be in solution? Okay, because it's really difficult. And again, because we created laws that make it really difficult. Um, and essentially what, what US policy says is, officially we don't want Latin American immigrants, but we want their labor. So they're crossing to the United States, 
they don't have papers. We'll essentially just turn a blind eye and let them work because our economy needs them. But we do not want them to become citizens. That's what the policy says. I'm not saying that's what everybody in the US thinks, right? But that's what, that's what the official policy says. And so they've actually made it very, very difficult if you come into the United States without a visa to ever apply for citizenship. Uh, other question? Yeah, it's one of the things I try to really drive home in my US history classes. Is people, we tend to think that laws are permanent and we can't change them. It's like the whole, like our, the whole problem with illegal or undocumented workers is because of a law that we put in place that we could easily change. Um, yeah. What's like the Mexican political opinion mm -hmm. on Mexican workers migrating to the United States? Um, so economically seen as really important, and I can't remember the percentage, but it's in the billions of dollars that are sent from Mexicans working in the United States to support families and communities in Mexico. So they're seen as economically really important. The Mexican government is also concerned with the rights of Mexicans in the United States, whether they're here legally or not. So they, the Mexican government does advocate on behalf of people of Mexican descent living in the United States, trying to watch out for, um, to protect their rights as workers, um, to pr protect their rights as migrants. But if you look at the political there's a political imbalance in power, right? That the United States has a lot of political power around the world and Mexico does not have as much. So although the Mexican government really wants to advocate on behalf of Mexican migrants in the United States, they can't always get what they want, right? They can't always get really strong protections from Mexican workers. The United States ultimately is much more powerful, both economically and politically. Does that answer your question? Yeah. It was really interesting. I was doing this research to, to remember that um, like the economies and the labor force of a place like California and Baja California are really integrated. They're actually not two separate places. They're, there might be a border that goes across between the two nations and the two states, but that workforce is one that spans the border. Those products that they're working really hard to grow is something that spans the border, right? Ends up on our tables. So you can't can't ever really separate the United States of Mexico or California, Baja California. They're very, very deeply integrated. Anything else? Any yeah. So um, we talked about kind of root of the problem: um, people uprising, resistance being a kind of attempts to bring a systematic change. Our group here is a you know, youth community service organization that goes down and every once a year, you know, provides some service. So within that whole bigger picture, what do you think, what are kind of, um, I guess, like, um, advice that you want to give to Green Green? Mm. I think, and this comes from working with Danny and Sheila, uh, it's one, it's important to listen to the people that you're working with, right? That, uh, that we are not determining what's best for people or what they need, but that, and I know it's hard because of language barriers and things like that, but that we're attentive to, um, what do indigenous communities or workers themselves say? What do indigenous communities or workers themselves say that they need, right? What, what, and what movements are they participating in? What organizations are they part of to try to create change for themselves? Because I guarantee they exist. Um, and can, one of the resources I sent you is like a long list of Oaxacan organizations in Baja, California. So it'd be interesting to see what those communities themselves are working on. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, workers in Mexico are probably in, many of them are in really dire circumstances. So you guys said like, they're sleeping on the floors, they don't have beds. So there's an immediate need that needs to be met. But the other thing is to think about, well, how do we create bigger change? And 
So outside of like, direct service activities, which are important, how do we create a better world at a, a bigger level? Um, and I think it's continuing to do what you guys are doing, but also thinking about are there larger organizations that you would want to work with that have that are working towards the world that you want to see? And I know that sounds kind of abstract, but uh, maybe it's looking for an immigrant rights organization that operates here in Southern California and that you know, organizes calls to representatives right now, right? When the Americans are outraged that families are being separated at the border and children are being torn away from their parents. But there are all kinds of um, organizations that are, you know, call your senators, call your elected representatives, um, let them know that you want policy change. I guess those two things, right? Coupling direct service and helping people with immediate needs, but also looking for what are the bigger, like what laws do we want to change so the world is better? What laws can we take away so people don't have to be undocumented? All right, I promise you an hour. It's been a little more than an hour, so <laughs> I'll stop. Uh, but it was really fun meeting you guys. Thank you. Thank you.